flat earthers are some of the dumbest people on earth. Okay, so if I'm honest, that's not exactly something I'd expect to hear from a flat earther in one of his own lectures, but it did get me intrigued and I'm glad it did because what followed, it really was it. The worst flat earth video I have ever seen. So exactly what does it take to put together the worst flat earth presentation of all time? Well, first of all, you can't say everything wrong. Every now and then you've got to say something that's correct. When you go on a plane, it takes off. And after that, of course, you've got to say something that's wrong, but no more wrong than a normal flat earther would say. The sun appears to rise, but it doesn't. It's at the same height. And then finally, you've got to say some things which are just so far out of town that you leave your own audience wondering whether you're even serious at all. If you were travelling from Scotland down to, uh, to London on a ball, it would be downhill all the way. You wouldn't need to put any petrol in your car. You'd just use your brakes. When you got to the airport, the, uh, the runway was flat, wasn't it? But you can't have flat runways on a ball, can you? Oh yeah, one more thing. Even though you're a flat earther and you like telling other people to constantly be asking questions, don't forget to insult your own audience members for asking questions. Uh, your, your academic qualifications don't mean jack shit to me. They're, not, they're worthless. You're a deluded. You're deluded. You probably believe in evolution, don't you? So now we're done with the introduction, please join me as we unravel what I can only describe as the most fascinating example of Dunning-Kruger I have ever witnessed. Okay everybody sit down, I've just made up a whole load of nonsense and I can't wait to share it with you. Now this presentation can be split up into several chunks and we're going to start off with photography and how images are proof of the flat earth. Now do you think he starts off this section by showing photographs that have confused flat earthers before? Maybe like this photograph of the Chicago skyline. Do you think he maybe produces observer heights and distances that have been verified by independent surveyors? Do you think he does simple curve calculator calculations to produce data to support his stance? Or maybe you predicted that he would do exactly what we're about to see. And even though I've watched this four times over, I still have absolutely no idea what on earth he's trying to say. I've just picked these few out. You have a look. This is what, these are what's coming up. Some of them are subliminal, yeah? This was nothing about flat earth, but look at these images that you're getting. The line we left, check it out. Yeah, there's a lot of flat here. So it goes from flat to a curved road to flat again. Flat as a pancake. Flat, flat, a, a bendy bridge, a curved bridge. Look, they're showing you the contrast between flat and curved just to confuse you. It's to play with your mind. Now you've got something stood on a ball, yeah? What's that got doing in, in something that's nothing to do with the flat earth? A flat beach, a dead fish, a circular, flat, flat disc. And some of these pictures of the ball are subliminal, so they're only in for a split second. So that's a pancake again. These are burgers, but this is symbolic of being flat earth. And there we have it. Somehow pictures of dead fish on a beach and burgers on a production line are evidence that the media is trying to hide the flat earth. Um, but he does up his game on photography just a little bit by producing two photographs that he claims perfectly demonstrate a flat earth. It's just a shame he chose the wrong two. Everywhere you look, the earth is flat. Except on this picture here, where the bottom of the mountain range is missing due to the curvature of the earth. Problem is, ever since you were a child, you've been conditioned to think that you live on a sphere. And the other problem is, in this picture here, 90% of the sun has been chopped off from the bottom as it's hidden by the curvature of the earth. Anyway, that last photograph does bring us on to the next section in this presentation, and that is the sun. <laughs> Yes, that last picture definitely left me with a burning question. So how does he explain the sunset then? On a flat earth, what is actually happening? And the hole that he somehow manages to dig himself while answering that seemingly simple question is just a thing of beauty. Starting here. The sun appears to rise, but it doesn't. It's at the same height. It's perspective. So it appears to be highest when it's by you. If you look down a railway line, you'll see it narrow into the distance and you'll see the railway pile, the, ra the telegraph lines going down into nothing. Now we have all heard that ridiculous statement before that the sun vanishes in the sky due to just perspective. 
And we are by now all well aware of why that is wrong. If we look at this photograph here, we can see both the railway lines and the trees are getting narrower in that left to right direction and also smaller in the top to bottom direction which is completely different to what we see in this picture of the sun here, which doesn't seem to be getting smaller at all, only hidden. But I don't need to tell him that because one of his own audience members decides to do it for me, and the answer he receives is golden. You won't, pardon? It doesn't, no, but the, the creator can do anything he likes with the sun. So there we have it, absolutely golden. We can use physics to try and prove a flat earth. But when we realise that physics doesn't actually prove a flat earth, it doesn't matter because it doesn't have to anyway. Absolutely amazing. Um, now, our presenter here decides that we are still a little bit naive about uh, perspective. So he tries to educate us just a little bit more. They're not getting smaller. It's just that your range of vision has what's called a vanishing point after, you know, which is where the horizon is, which is about three miles. You can't see beyond that. And all the sun does... It goes outside your range of vision. It's always there. Okay, so by that logic... Well, according to his logic, and what he's just very carefully spelled out to us, given the fact that we can still see this sun, it must be within three miles. I do hope he doesn't go on and make a fool of himself and debunk his own argument. How far away is it then? It's about 3,000 miles away. And it's only about 35 miles across. Is there any way you can prove that? Yeah, with a, if you use one of those um, chron chronoscope things. Okay, so just to summarise that point, the sun is something we should only be able to see if it's less than three miles away, but the sun that we can see is actually 3,000 miles away, but that's okay because we can prove it's 3,000 miles away by using a chronoscope thingy, which is actually a timekeeping device that we find in watches. Now, at this point, the audience do start to get a little bit tetchy and throw in some more questions of their own. And when that happens, as a flat earth presenter, it's important to remember that not knowing the answers is okay. But what's not okay is admitting it. If you don't know an answer, you must do the only thing left to a flat earther. And that is, make up the biggest load of nonsense you possibly can. What happened with the eclipse of the sun about 15 years ago? Yeah, that, we, they reckon that there may be what's called a black sun in the sky which causes it. Well, flat earthers are some of the dumbest people on earth. Now, smelling blood, the audience take the lecture slightly off topic by asking even more pretty sensible questions. Now, he's already tried. He bounced off the, off the, the upper limits. OK, so the Virgin Galactic test flights that have reached the edge of the atmosphere haven't actually reached the edge of the atmosphere. They just bounced off some sort of ceiling or dome or container. I wonder what Richard Branson thinks about that. It seems like an awful waste of money. Yeah, but he don't know. Oh, that's right, he doesn't know. Silly me, yeah. It turns out that some guy in Blackpool giving a flat earth lecture is privy to more inside information about the Virgin Galactic test flights than Sir Richard Branson himself. It all makes perfect sense. Anyway, I wonder how high up the dome actually is. How high up is it in the ceiling? It's about 100,000, uh, about 10 kilometres. I mean. Right, now, first of all, make your mind up. Second of all, if you meant 100,000 feet, that is about 30 kilometres, which is about 19 miles. If you meant 10 kilometres, that is just over six miles. But either way, it wasn't that long ago that you were saying this. How far away is it then? It's about 3,000 miles away, and it's only about 35 miles across. So now this magic sun that we can actually see is something we shouldn't see if it was further than three miles away, but we do see it even though it's 3,000 miles away. And now 3,000 miles away is almost 3,000 miles above the dome. This is all getting very complicated. Flat earthers are some of the dumbest people on earth. Anyway, that was the sun dealt with. Next topic. You believe in gravity. Why do you believe in gravity? Well, to put it simply, it's because we understand its behaviour very, very well. We've also detected gravitational waves at LIGO, and we can use this equation here to make accurate predictions in the real world. Can you tell me the mathematical, mathematical formula for gravity? Yeah, I just did show you. It was this equation here. Anybody tell me the mathematical formula for gravity? Yep, it's this equation here. It's not difficult to find. It's not hiding. I'll tell you what, I've looked for it on the internet trying to find out Einstein's maths for it. It ain't there. 
Right, it appears that that's gravity well and truly dealt with then. Um, before anybody posts this in the comment section, I do realise that that is Newton's equation and not Einstein's. But let's remember, Newton's equation tried to describe to us what we see, whereas Einstein's work was more about why we see it. They're not mutually exclusive, as many flat earthers would have you believe. Anyway, next topic. So you're looking out a window of Concorde. If the Earth was a ball, you're going to be looking down to the horizon. But the horizon is always at eye level. It doesn't matter whether you're on the top of Mount Everest or on the ground, you'll see the horizon at your eye level. Now, finally, this is a point worth addressing because to the human senses, it very well may seem like that. And here's why. So for somebody who's about six foot tall, the horizon is about three miles away. So simple trigonometry that we learn at school tells us that to see the horizon, we've got to tilt our eyes down by only 0.03 degrees. Now this is such a small angle that the human brain just can't differentiate that from looking level. Now Concorde flew at about 60,000 feet, and if we put that into the curve calculator, we'll see that that puts the horizon at just over 300 miles away. And the very same, very basic trigonometry tells us that from that height, if we're going to look at the horizon, we have to tilt our eyes down by just 2.17 degrees. Now, if you want to know what that looks like, it looks like this, the angle between the blue and red line here. Again, almost impossible to detect without proper equipment. But luckily, we do have proper equipment. So for the second video on the trot, I'm going to be recommending a Wolfie 6020 video. He is a professional pilot, and this is the view from his cockpit as he's using state-of-the-art technology to show the horizon drop. This video is linked in the description, and I suggest you go and watch it. And it appears that the view of the horizon from a plane isn't the only thing that debunks a globe Earth. Apparently flight paths do as well, as all man is going to go on and explain, until he gets debunked by a member of his own audience and your conventional map. Let's see what these routes look like. So, here we have Santiago, South America. Yeah, up to that, the, um, the east coast of America, across to the west coast, and down to Sydney. Does that make any sense to you? They're flying twice as, the passengers are, you know, it's taking them best part of three days to get there. If they can get there in 14 hours, why is the plane taking the red line? Well, there could be a number of reasons the plane is choosing that flight path. For example, economics. You know, ask yourself, would it be cheaper to have one plane fly all three routes or three planes each flying those routes individually? Who knows? But the bigger problem you've got here is that you think the red line is the quickest point between A and B. Now, what you've got to realise is that when we turn a globe into a flat map, you distort the picture. And that means that the fastest path between these two points on a globe is anything but your red line. Anyway, don't listen to me. Why don't you harass one of your own audience members and get them to debunk you? Lady in the back, come on, explain this. Yeah, because Use your degree to tell me why they're going this crazy route. Anyway, before she gets up and does that, a little bit of information. Now, at this point, what I've got to explain is he has taken this flight path shown by the yellow lines and plotted it on his own flat earth map so it looks like this. Now his argument is that planes will always take the shortest path between two points, which is a straight line. And it turns out that with this one particular flight path on a flat earth map, that's exactly what happens. Oh dear, I do hope that the lady from the back doesn't get up and immediately point out a flight path that makes no sense on a flat earth. Right. Project, this, is, this, is the, this is the actual map used by the USGS. Okay then, explain yeah. to me then why when you go from Britain to Australia, you go that way, then that way, and then over there, rather than go straight that way. Hmm? I'm not talking about Australia, I haven't plotted that one on. Yeah, let's not talk about Australia, because to be fair to the guy, he probably didn't even think as far as double checking his idea against more than one flight path. She's so mean. Anyway, next topic. Somebody give me a planet. Uranus. Why aren't there any photographs? Of Uranus? They're not real, they're composites. And NASA admit the photographs are composites. Except this one, taken in 1966 by the Lunar Orbiter 1. But that doesn't matter because even though our presenter here doesn't believe that any pictures of planets are real, that doesn't stop him hand-selecting some of the best artistic representations of planets on the internet and putting them together as a slideshow. Oh, look at that. You can see the Earth's moon from Mars. Tell me, give me another planet. So you look at this picture, You've got all this stuff in the background. Let's look at the next one. 
different colour again. Totally black on this one. There's no stars in the background on that one. Different angle this time. Shadows this time. Now, I really could have gone on and on and on and on with this video. It was truly spectacular. But I'm going to end with this one very poignant question. Why would the government, the elite, whoever, why would they lie to us about the shape of the earth? Can you explain why they want this picture? You said it's to keep us in the dark and to show what's the advantage of that? Of what? Hiding the truth for these people. Well, because they want you to, because these are evil people, they want you to think you're insignificant. Yeah? yeah so, that's 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 that. That. Okay, almost there. Just one last question before I go. Why would they want us to feel insignificant? What what good would it do them? Wait for it. I don't know. What a surprise. Bye.